It's good to be back. Good evening. It's good to see everyone this evening. It's good to be back. Thank you so much for your... <laughs> it's great to be back. Thank you very much. Uh, Teresa was here with me today, and uh, we got some things done. She uh, she overheated a little bit, so she's home watching online. And uh, But Mom's doing better, uh, and so thank you so much for your prayers. Uh, we appreciate that, uh, but yes, it's great to be back, and thank you so much for keeping us in your prayers, and we, we appreciate it so much. Um, before we start, Proverbs, the seventh chapter, boy, it sure is good not to have to do, do this online. It's so much easier to just be here and, and do it in person, but um, before we get there, uh, any other prayer requests that we need to remember? I don't know if you know it, but Rose Diamond is in the hospital at Holy Cross. Uh, they think maybe she had a stroke, and so they're trying to decide, they're running tests today, trying to decide whether, what caused it, either something in the brain or something in the heart, and uh, so that's what they're checking for. So, uh, are we not working? The oh, the light? Oh, it should be over there. So let's keep Rose uh, in our prayers uh, because she uh, she won't know anything probably, but she felt fine. I, we talked to her today. Teresa and I both called her and uh, talked to her on speakerphone, and she she seems like she was just fine. She felt fine. So let's keep her in our prayers. Anyone else? Yes. Okay. Okay, Nancy. Okay. She has COVID too? Oh, okay. They probably won't do that until they get the COVID cleared up. Okay. All right, any other request? All right, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we bow before you and thank you so much for being our God and our being able to come to you and bring our petitions before you. Before we even go there, Lord, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for Jesus to send him into this cold, dark world to take upon himself our sins. Thank you for loving us so much. Father, you've heard all the ones that are in need of your help. And Lord, we lift them up to you and, and we just ask that you be with each person. You know every need, every aspect of every person everywhere. But Father, we lift these before you and asking that you intervene in their health situations, that they might find healing and they might take their normal place in life. We pray, Father, for all those who are on our prayer list. There are so many who have so many different needs, and Lord, we just ask that if it's within the boundaries of your will, that you'll heal each one. For those who are grieving, those who have suffered loss, Father, comfort them as only you can. And Father, for those who are on our prayer list that do not know you, we ask, Lord, that they might realize their great need for you and that they might come to you be with us now as we study these proverbs from solomon help us to gain wisdom and be wise as we walk through this world all the days of our life help us remain faithful and true thank you again for jesus it's in his name we pray Amen. All right, Proverbs, the seventh chapter. By the way, I did download the ESV because that's what I'm uh, usually reading from. Uh, this one's the New King James, and then I've got ESV on my pad. So uh, the ESV is what I've 
outline my notes with, but keep in mind where we're coming from, all right? Chapter 6, remember these first 10 chapters that uh, Solomon pens is basically uh, contrasting wisdom with folly and uh, understanding with foolishness. And then lots of warnings about lots of different types of people. Now, keep in mind that he's also giving this wisdom uh, to his sons. Uh, if you look at the beginning of, uh, let's see, uh, this one has a lot of extra notes. But if you go back and look at chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7 now, he starts off by saying, my son. Now, the message always puts it, dear friend, which I think is interesting. But... Uh, <laughs> It starts off as far as the ESV and the New American Standard and New King James, my son. So keep in mind that Solomon is not being chauvinistic when he warns his son about the seductress, okay? Because that's where he's going to go tonight, again. Because this son of his may very well have been in his late teens or early 20s. And these Proverbs really are... Real life, you know, he talks about the thieves. He talks about those who are uh, looking to deceive you, the ones who are looking to catch you. Uh, but for a young man in his teens or early 20s, this would be a real life temptation that he would have to face. And especially, and I mean, we look at the world we're in and it's bad, but there were just as many bad things going on back then. They just didn't have CNN and Fox News and all these world news networks to report them instantly and you knew about everything happening in the world. But these things are still out there. Right. Now, not as bad. But I bet his son never started No, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure he did. <laughs> I'm sure that they understood whether they were boys or girls. I'm not sure. That's a brand new thing, you know. Even though Solomon himself will say there's nothing new under the sun. So I'm wondering, all right, wonder where they had this at back then. But anyway, uh, this is a real life temptation for a young man. And so he'll deal with this a number of times before we get into the little snippets. And the snippets will start in chapter 10, toward the end of chapter 10, and then on down till we get to 30. All right? So let's, uh, let's pick this up and let's just, let's just read uh, the first nine verses from the ESV. Uh, so Sam, if you'll kick us off. Okay, okay. let's stop there for now. Again, he starts off the proverb by addressing his son. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Now, keep in mind, this isn't just Solomon saying, hey, these are my laws, these are rules in my house. I mean, I know a lot of, a lot of fellows who say that. This is my house is going to be my 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 dad said that I can do whatever I want when I move out, you know, when I was a teenager. But this is my house, my rules, right? Solomon's not approaching it just from that mentality. Now, I'm sure that's part of his mentality, especially when he was younger and wiser. As he became older, he began to follow his wife's uh, pagan gods, and from what I can tell, in his old age, departed from the Lord and gave way to uh, paganism because of his many wives who drew him off, and he followed them, which is interesting because here he's giving his son advice about not following this seductress, but in another way, he seduced at the end of his life to follow pagan gods from all the different wives that he had married that were not Israelites who worshipped uh, a plethora of uh, pagan gods. So he starts off, though, my son, keep my words, treasure them up, and treasure my commandments with you. It's sort of like Joshua saying, as for me and my house, what? We shall serve the Lord, right. So you got to think that way when you're reading these, these commands of Solomon 
uh, these are the commandments of the Lord. And keep in mind also that as you read in the Bible, this is all theopneustos. This is all God-breathed, all right? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may find be perfect or complete, is actually what the Greek says, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Peter would actually say, according to his divine power, he hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. So the scriptures are inspired by God. Uh, the word theopneustos, inspired, is how it's translated. I believe the New American Standard actually says, it may be the NIV, but one of those versions say God breathed. Theo, God, neustos, breath. God breathed. God inspired the scriptures. If you look over to Corinthians, I can't remember exactly where it is, but Paul would actually say, I believe it was in the uh, first letter he wrote to the church there. Uh, it's actually in the show tomorrow at 12 o'clock, uh, dealing with what would Jesus ask you is the name of that show. Uh, but it's in that show that Paul said that if anyone's spiritual among you, if anyone is a prophet or if anyone has insight spiritually, let them acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commands of the Lord. In other words, it's not just what you see in red letters, all right, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's, it's bigger than that. The whole New Testament is inspired by God and also the Old Testament. And Solomon, in his youth, as a younger father, was led by God. He had great wisdom. And next to Jesus, he was the wisest man who ever lived. But the warning for us in the life of Solomon is that if the devil can work in such a way as to get into the life of the wisest man who's ever lived up until that point and manage to pull him away, don't give him any room in your life. Because if you let him in in any shape, form, or fashion, he can tear it to pieces. You crack the door just a little bit, you could get in trouble letting him into your life. Because if he can pull away the wisest man on the face of the planet, he can pull you and me away if we let him in. And that's the danger. But here, as you look at this, he says, My son, keep my words, treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. You think he's talking about just life, live life, or he's thinking about talking about spiritually live? I think he's talking about the latter. I mean, he's going to live one way or the other, but his life could be shortened because of frolicking and foolishness and all those uh, things that he could pursue, and Solomon will address those. But he says, uh, keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. I like the way the message puts it. Uh, do what I say and you will live well. My teaching is as precious as your eyesight. Guard it. And so I think, you know, that's, he's trying to convey the, the value of this wisdom that he's, that he's trying to share with his son. Who, again, we move in this proverb to the, to the adulteress who can draw him away. Now, watch what he says in 3, 4, and 5. He says, bind them on your fingers... Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call insight your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. Now, what does that sound like? Sounds like back over there in chapter 5, doesn't it? Sounds like over there, the adulteress with her smooth words, her, her lips dripping with honey, you know. And he's actually going to get into that just a little bit Uh the message puts it this way, write it on the back of your hands, etch it on the chambers of your heart. Talk to wisdom as to a sister, treat insight as your companion. They'll be with you and fend off the temptress, that smooth talking, honey tongued seductress. I like the personality of the message. Again, it's just a paraphrase, but still, he has a way of putting things sometimes, and, and sometimes it works out better than a commentary. You don't have to read five pages to get what one verse is talking about. Now, as you look at verses 6 through 9, he starts, in essence, saying, this is how I've seen this going. I, uh, my grandmother, 
lived in a small cottage behind the house where we lived when we were younger, uh, right before I went in the Air Force, actually, at 19. But she would sit down in her, she had a recliner right, right next to the front window, and she was always looking out that window. Always looking to see who's driving down the street. What are they doing? Where are they going? You know, she kept tabs on everybody and everything. She knew when you left. She knew when you come back. And it wouldn't surprise me. She sat up half the night making sure you got home at a decent hour. But he says, for at the window of my house, I have looked out through my lattice. I have seen among the simple. I have perceived among the youths a young man lacking sense. The message puts it like this. As I stood at the window of my house, looking out through the shutters, watching the mindless crowd stroll by, I spotted a young man without any sense. Arriving at the corner of the street where she lived, then turning up the path to her house. It was dark, the evening coming on, the darkness thickening into night. What's he talking about? He's saying, I've seen this happen, son. I've seen this happen with other people. And actually, the way he talks about this, he doesn't have any sense. He doesn't have any sense. He's not thinking this through in any way. Passing along the street near her corner. And, and what's he going to try to say here? Basically, don't go into this neighborhood. He, he's actually going to come around to that. Uh, it's sort of like if you had a struggle with alcohol, hanging out at the liquor store, because that's where all your old friends are going all the time, you know? Wouldn't be a good place to hang out if you'd, you'd beat it and you were on the wagon and you hadn't, uh, you hadn't had a drink in a year. Hanging out at the liquor store wouldn't be a good place to hang out. Probably going to fold in there somewhere, uh, and especially with your friends egging you on. Now let's look at uh, 10 through 15. Uh, I don't know who we left off with. 10 through 15. Okay, all right, let's stop there. So he's, he's saying, these are the things I've seen. I've seen this young man, and he goes out, it's getting dark. Have you ever wondered why more crime happens at night than it does during the day? I find it interesting that John, when John records the, the Last Supper, Jesus, he records something that Matthew and Mark and Luke do not, and that he said to Judas, what you're going to do, do quickly and Judas went out and John throws in and it was night it's interesting if you were to review statistics most likely most crime takes place in darkness because we we sort of consider it sort of a, a natural veil it covers us I, I can't tell you we've got a ring doorbell here and man I'm on some kind of feed and it notifies me every time there's a lost dog or a lost cat. But what's really interesting is it shows you some of the things happening around a lot of people's front doors. And it shows you that people coming up to doors, checking doors to see if they're open. A lot of people checking doors of cars and driveways to see. None of this stuff happens pretty much, maybe one or two here and there. But for the most part, most of it happens at night. And, of course, the ring doorbell has infrared, so it can actually see. Everything's gray, but still it can see. And uh, I've even had someone up here ringing the doorbell at 1230 at night and then changing clothes in front of the front door, you know, right out there in front of the front door at 1230, 1 o'clock at night. Of course, I didn't answer the doorbell by any means. Uh, you know, I didn't want to get into a conversation with her, frankly. But most stuff happens at night. And he's saying, look, I've seen this young man. He doesn't have a whole lot of sense. He's walking up her street. Now he's turning a corner. He's basically moving in the direction of where the temptation can meet him. And again, that's uh, probably not the smartest thing to do. What did uh, Paul tell Timothy when it came to youthful lust? Flee. Flee youthful lust. What did Joseph do when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him? 
He got out of there, man. He just took off. He wasn't going to talk about, let's talk about this, all right? We need to talk about this. Let's just settle down, you know. No, he just said, I got to go. And, of course, he left his garment behind, and she accused him, and he goes back to jail again, and God still uses him, and eventually he comes to second in power in all of Egypt. But it appears that this scenario here, this woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart, uh, the message says a woman met him. She had been lying in wait for him, dressed to seduce him. Brazen and brash she was, restless and roaming, never at home. Walking the streets, lottering in the mall, hanging out at every corner in town. She threw her arms around him and kissed him. Boldly took his arm and said, I've got the makings of a feast. Today I made my offerings. What's that? That's paganism. That's paganism. I've made my offerings. My vows are all paid. And now I've come to find you, hoping to catch sight of your face. And here you are. I mean, it just sounds like he's probably thinking, oh, yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm, you, you're lucky to have me tonight. You know, that's all there is to it. Let's go have a, let's go a barbecue. You know, let's have some fun. And that's a mistake. Solomon's saying, you shouldn't even be in that neighborhood, man. You should get out of that neighborhood. That's bad stuff. And you know what? The thing about these Proverbs is it's relevant to a lot of situations in life, not just this kind of situation. I mean, you don't want to go down to the, to the red light district if you've got a problem with being seduced or something like that. You don't want to go online to certain websites. They're going to entice you and take you to lusting after things. You want to stay away from that stuff. But it, it, it's bigger than that. Because there's drugs and there's alcohol and there's all kinds of different temptations that come in a thousand different formats. And he's dealing with them as we go along. Now, no, they didn't have methamphetamines back then. But they did have alcohol. They did have wine. And, you know, I, I'm not going to be one of these preachers stand up here and tell you, well, you can't, turn, you can't, you can't have a drink of wine. Paul actually told Timothy to have, a, have wine instead of water for his stomach's sake for medicinal purposes. Uh, I've heard one person, one preacher get up in the pulpit and say, if you take a drink of wine, you're one drink drunk. Well, let's take that logic all the way out. You eat a bite of food, you're one bite of glutton, you know. The thing is, it's wrong to be drunk. It's wrong to have drunkenness in your life. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, the Bible says. And I'll be honest with you, the last thing I want to do is if Jesus shows up and I'm drunk, second coming of Christ, that wouldn't be a good, that wouldn't be a very good awakening, would it, you know. I think we need to be sober, sober-minded, always ready for the coming of the Lord. But the fact is, there's a thousand different temptations. It's not just about the woman seducing the young man. It's about all kinds of temptations out there. I mean, today in our world, they're everywhere. They're on the billboards. They're on the radio. They're on the Internet. They're on the television. Now, I grew up in a time when cigarette ads were on television. You know, most doctors smoke camels. You know, and, and that kind of thing. <laughs> and no filters. I mean, I grew up in that age. I also grew up in the age where milkmen left your bottle of milk on the front porch, you know. <laughs> so, anyway, I mean, the, the times have changed, but guess what? They've just shifted into a more, efficient, a more efficient way of tempting. The devil is a master at temptation. A master at temptation. And he comes at you, and don't think for a moment that he doesn't know your weak spots. Because he does. He's been doing this a long, long time. And I mean, think about it. Right off the bat, Adam and Eve, I think he said two sentences. And that was enough to totally get Adam and Eve to distrust God, to doubt God, to consider God's word to be untrue and the devil's word to be true. Thou shalt not surely die. God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, you'll become like God knowing good and evil. He, in just two sentences, was able to throw mankind on his ear and let sin enter into the world. So don't think he doesn't know your weaknesses. He does. But <clears throat> this woman, she has a quest, a target, and it's the young man. Now, it, it does indicate dressed as a prostitute, so... You know, like dressed up like a prostitute or, you know, was she a prostitute? She's just trying to get the money out of his pocket. Uh, 
you have to sort of look at that and try to figure that one out. Definitely not the neighborhood he needs to be in, though. All right, so let's go 16 through 23. 16 through 23, wherever we left off. Sam. Okay, so the, the trap is readied, and the hunter has found her prey. I mean, look at the words. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linens. How many of y'all have seen Egyptian cotton bedspreads, or not bedspreads, uh, sheets and all that? I believe, uh, I believe we actually have one set like that, and... It just, you just sort of slide right off of it, you know. I don't like it. Fella slides off on the floor at night, you know. I don't like satin sheets either, you know. But this is all part of the, this is all part of the trap, all right. This is all part of the trap. I've spread fresh, clean sheets on my bed, colorful imported linens. My bed is aromatic with spices and exotic fragrances. Come now, let us love all night. Spend the night in ecstatic love making. That's the message, and it's pretty. Hope there's no kids watching tonight. All right, but the fact is, what's she doing? She's building him up. She's going to trap him. Now, watch what happens here. It says, <laughs> before we do that, for my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. So, what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with a wife of another man. Which is very similar to back what we were looking at in chapter 5. Sam? Yeah. Yeah. But she's assuring him too. He's not coming home. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon he'll come home. We got, we got days. You can stay as long as you want to stay. It's all good. He ain't going to come home and shoot you. Don't worry about that. You're good to go. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. Watch 22. All at once, he follows her. It's like, okay. How many of y'all saw Forrest Gump? Everybody see Forrest Gump? Okay. You know, <laughs> here he goes. He's like, I'm out. That's good enough for me. Sounds good to me. We're going to have a party. And he is snared, but look what the wise man says. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, as a stag is caught fast, till an arrow pierces its liver, a bird rushes into the snare. He does not know that it will cost him his life. Let me tell you something. This is serious when it comes to real life, because what if that husband comes home early, you know? We read last week where he's, he's not going to be satisfied. You're not going to be able to pay him off. You're not going to be able to talk your way out of it. You're probably going to at least get a black eye and might even get worse than that. I can't tell you. I wonder. I, I didn't look up the statistics, but I wonder how many men are in prison today because of jealous rages because they caught their spouse or, or women maybe even who caught their... I, I seen something on uh, YouTube the other day. I was looking and it has these YouTube shorts and it had one guy who had took a, a mannequin and made it out to look like another woman and was laying in the bed with the covers over it and the wife came in and he filmed her reaction. And let me tell you what, if that would have been a real other person, that person would have been in trouble because she snatched that mannequin's head off like it wasn't nothing. I was like, whoa, man, that woman mad. And then she got mad because he pranked her. You know, and then she was, he was in trouble not only because of the, the, what she thought initially and sent her blood boiling, but uh, the fact that he pranked her, and then 
I wonder if she didn't know it was on film and then later on saw it on YouTube, and he's probably dead by now. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the fact is, this is a trap, and it can end in disaster. I wonder how many people are in jail or have gone to jail because of jealous rages and that kind of thing. All at once he follows her and Ox goes to the slaughter. I mean, he's not sparing any description here. Before you know it, he's trotting behind her like a calf led to the butcher shop, like a stag lured into an ambush. That's how the message puts it. So I, I, I find it like this is, this is serious stuff. Have y'all, I, I know all of you have at least heard this from me, if you were here on the Sunday, but I preached on the counting the cost and where Jesus says, which one of you goes to, you know, builds a vineyard and says, I'm going to build a tower and everything doesn't count the cost first. Well, what's he dealing with then? Then he's dealing with real estate, right? So it's going to cost you a lot of money if this doesn't work and you didn't sit back and make plans and made sure you knew how to do this and cover all those expenses. But then he takes it and notches it up. Which one of you or which king goes out with 10,000 up against someone who has 20,000, or will he not first send an adversary to negotiate terms of peace? Because now we're not talking about a real estate deal. We're not talking about buying a piece of land. We're not talking about structures. We're talking about life and death. We're talking about men are going to die here if they don't count the cost and negotiate terms of peace because with 10,000, you can't meet 20,000 and come away victorious in that situation unless the Lord's with you. You can go out with 300 and take care of it then. But the fact is, what's he doing? He's ratcheting it up. He's actually knocking it up to where, look, first story, real estate. Buy a piece of land, plant a vineyard, build a tower. You got enough money to finish that. Okay. Nobody dies in that scenario. Second scenario, king with 10,000 looking to meet 20,000. Now, you, have you counted the cost here? 10,000 person king? Have you counted the cost? Because if you haven't, you better send an adversary to make some peace negotiation or a lot of your fellows are going to die if not all of them so now we're talking about something serious here he's talking about listen this is a trap that could cost you your life if it doesn't cost you your life physically it can still cost you your spiritual life because where do you go from here you know you show up on sunday morning for church you know spent the weekend with the girl some other man's wife and now you're going to show up for church i mean where does that take you spiritually I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd be like, yeah, the last place I'd want to go after a weekend with this girl would be church on Sunday morning, you know. Probably be going, nah, I don't want to, I don't want to go there, you know. You'd avoid that situation. It would end up costing you spiritually speaking. When I was a younger man in the Air Force, we got paid on the 1st and the 15th of every month. And we didn't make a lot of money. I was an enlisted man, and I was an airman at the time. I think I had two stripes, senior airman. And um, anyway, money ran. I had more month left at the end. I had more month left at the end of the money than I had money at the end of the month. And I asked one of my roommates. I said, "Can I borrow fifty bucks until I get paid?" Well, he loaned it to me. But then I got paid, and I guess I wasn't as quite as frugal with money as I should have been back in those younger days. And before I knew it, I didn't have the money to pay him the fifty bucks, or I'd be broke again. I'd have to borrow him another fifty bucks. So guess what I did? I started avoiding going home when I knew he was there. And he worked a second shift. I worked first shift, he worked second shift. So I knew all I gotta do is go somewhere for about an hour or so, and then he'll be gone to work and I can go home then. But I started avoiding him. Well, man, if you get in this kind of situation, last place you're gonna wanna go on Saturday, the Sabbath, is temple. Because you've been frolicking around here. So guess what? It can cost you more than just your physical life. It can cost you your spiritual life. And that's what Solomon, actually Solomon's life demonstrates that because of what happens to him at the end of his life. I mean, it troubles me. It really bothers me that Solomon's not mentioned in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. I mean, you got all these people. you got Samson in there. Samson was a womanizer and a liar and a deceiver and all kinds of stuff. But he's in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, because why? Right at the end, he straightened things out, you know, cost him his eyes, cost him his life. But at the very end, he comes back around to God, and God forgives him, and he kills more Philistines in his death than he did during his life. He's in there, but Solomon's not. Solomon's not mentioned. 
in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And that troubles me. That troubles me. Because here's the wisest man who's ever lived, with the exception of Christ himself. And he gets seduced. The very thing he's warning his son about. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he ends up being, (laughs) it's the pot calling the kettle black in the end, you know. I mean, it's actually saying, look, do all these things. Do everything I say do. And I think Solomon was devoted and dedicated. When he was writing these Proverbs, he was devoted, dedicated. I mean, he, God said, ask anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And what did he do? He asked for wisdom that I might be able to. He didn't ask for the lives of his enemies. He didn't ask for uh, lands or riches or any of those things. And God said, because you didn't ask for those things, but ask for wisdom, I'll give you all these things. And he became the richest man alive. And all kinds of adventures he went on trying to discover the meaning of life. Read Ecclesiastes, you know. He tries everything. But that leads him, maybe at the end of Ecclesiastes, he came up with the right conclusion. What was that? Fear God and keep his commandments. But this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or good. Or whether it be evil. So by the time he gets to the end of Ecclesiastes and he's chased it all down, he's still got it figured out. But in the process of chasing it all down, he starts marrying lots of women. 600 wives, 300 concubines, foreigners. Uh, Tradition says he married the Queen of Sheba when she came to visit with him and figure out his wisdom. The Queen of the South, I believe, is what Jesus refers to her as. But the path was being paved for him to follow after these pagan women that he had married and depart from the living God, which is what happened. So even though he is there giving this great advice, in the end of life, he ends up ignoring his own advice. Maybe because the devil didn't do it all at once. No one came knocking on his door saying, hey, come with me. I got new Egyptian sheets. I got the barbecue grill going. Just come with me. It didn't happen like that. It just happened little by little. Another wife, she wants, she wants to worship this other God. And, he, and I want to keep her happy. You know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I sit back sometimes and go, wow, I wonder how they managed, how they managed to pull him away. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But I know this situation, the trap is set. I mean, she's she's... She's assuring him everything's going to be fine. And all at once, okay, he goes. And it's a tragic mistake. Now, let's read the last uh, 24 through 27. I don't know where we left off. Yes. Sure. Yes. Yes, stupid decisions, stupid decisions. And, and it only takes one here and one there to, to lead you down the wrong path and then put you in a place where, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, look at, I look at the world today and, and you see all of these, so many different people with so many different struggles. And, and some of them hooked on drugs and some of them hooked on alcohol and just there's a whole world happening see I'm so old fashioned you know I'm happy to stay at home and watch Andy Griffith you know I'm happy with that that's fine with me that's a wild Friday night for me all right turn on Andy Griffith and uh, Dick Van Dyke you know I mean let's let's really splurge it up tonight but there's a whole world happening out there at night I know there is because right around the corner within earshot there's a club a gentleman's club and I hear that music pounding every night until 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, they quieten it down because every old person in the park that I live in is on the phone calling the cops, you know. But at 10 o'clock, up until 10 o'clock, boom, 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 it's going. There's a nightlife happening out there. And you know, when I was a younger man, when I wasn't a Christian, I don't know if y'all know that, I used to be a bouncer in a nightclub. And uh, two, 3,000 people show up every weekend, and it was a party every weekend. And it was so empty. It was so empty. It was so hollow. 
and it led nowhere. But thank goodness I found the Lord, and that life is no longer a life for me. And I look back at it now and think, what foolishness, what stupidity. But you know what? You think the people in the world know? You think they're planning on living these lives that end up hooked on drugs, prostitution, hooked on alcohol? They don't plan that. They don't, they don't write that down in elementary school. What do you want to be when you grow up? You know, well, I want to be hooked on drugs. I want, to be, I want to be a prostitute. They end up there in a lot of little bitty steps. They take them down the wrong road because they're making short decisions. They're not looking ahead. And here's the bad thing. Most of them don't realize there's a God on the other side of this whole thing that they're going to meet face to face one day. Now, God's powerful enough to pull people out of that lifestyle. One of the strongest preachers I know. I think he has just about most of the New Testament memorized. His name's Ray. Because we're online, I'll hold his last name. But I helped him get a scholarship to Harding University, and he's still preaching today. But he was converted with a five-year sentence in prison for the prison ministry that we had going on. He was converted in prison because he robbed a 7-Eleven. Now, he robbed the 7-Eleven so he could buy food for his wife and his kids. He didn't have no money. He didn't have no job. So I'm not going to justify it and say, well, that was okay, because it wasn't. But the wise man even brings that up. People won't get mad at a thief if he steals in order to feed himself or to feed his family. But this is a married woman. This is different. And in the previous proverb where he mentions this seductress, very similar in the phraseology. But in that, he says that, you know, this is, why, why do you want to hook up? Why do you want to be with someone who is actually going to betray her own husband? Why do you want to be with her? And so this, listen, as he comes down to the conclusion of this, uh, Jane, you're right, though. It's, it's small decisions. Uh, and David, yes, gave him this, wi pursue wisdom, keep the commands of the Lord, walk in his ways. And, of course, his sons did not. Solomon's sons did not. As they grew older, uh, they, they departed from the Lord. David, David had his problems too. Yeah, I mean, you know, you think of Solomon. Solomon was actually a product of an adulterous affair that David had with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. I mean, the child that she conceived in that adulterous affair died, I think, six days after it was born. But then Solomon was born. So he's the product of an adulteress affair but still he couldn't help that and at this point as he's writing these proverbs he's just giving real good advice to this young man who's in his late teens or early 20s most likely somewhere in there and the temptation when it comes to sexual temptation this is a reality then it's a reality now and he's saying stay away from that neighborhood don't even go in that neighborhood now 24 through 27 and we'll finish up Okay, so as he closes this out, he said, listen, listen to what I'm saying to you. How many times y'all say that to your kids? Listen to what I'm telling you. There's the cutest little video out there. I don't know what the name of it is, but there's this little bitty kid. Can't be more than three years old. And he's going, listen, Linda, listen, listen, listen. And he's talking to his mom, trying to convince her. He's going to be a car salesman, I'm sure of that. But uh, he is like, no, 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 listen, listen, listen. And he's trying to convince her that well, it's okay because grandma said it was okay. You know, it's hilarious. I'm sitting there going, this kid is like three years old, and he has great verbiage, and he's convincing his mom that it's okay because grandma said it's okay. And, uh, of course, all you grandmas and grandpas and all, they all be like, yeah, yeah, we're revenge on the kids. You know, we're getting them back now. But uh, the fact is, he's trying to do that here. Listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. Listen now, my son. Be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her. Don't go into her neighborhood. Stay out of there. That's the wrong place to be. Get away from that place. I find it interesting that when Jesus was left in Jerusalem at 12 years old, now you think about it, they went a day's journey before they realized he wasn't in the caravan. 
They probably traveled in a caravan of cousins and uncles and aunts and little John the Baptist probably running around, Jesus, all of them there. They go a whole day's journey before they realize he's not there. They go back to Jerusalem. I'm assuming it took them a day to get back. They search for him for three days. Five days. Jesus, 12 years old, all by himself. And he ain't at the playground. He ain't at the arcade. He's in the temple talking to the religious leaders of that day, asking questions, and they marveled at his wisdom at 12 years old. So where'd he go? He didn't go to the wrong neighborhood. He went to the right neighborhood. He said, yeah, look, I'm here all by myself. I better go there. I'm guessing they fed him, <laughs> took care of him for five days, but he went to church. He didn't go and get lost in some crowd and in some other place and play on the playground with the kids. He had enough sense to go where he needed to be. And then when they found him and said, you've, you've put us through a great deal of worry. We've anxiously sought for you. He said, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I would be in my father's house about my father's business? And he wasn't talking about Joseph. He was talking about God. At 12 years old, he knew what he was there for. He knew his path. Do not venture into her paths. Do not stray into her ways. For many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. What's he talking about? He's talking about this woman, or he's talking about the whole picture? I believe he's talking about the whole picture. Let me read it to you in the message. So, friends, listen to me. Take these words of mine most seriously. Don't fool around with a woman like that. Don't even stroll through her neighborhood. Countless victims come under her spell. She's the death of many a poor man. She runs a halfway house to hell. Fits you out with a shroud and a coffin. I just think, wow, that's <laughs> okay. Not the place to be. Not the place to be, especially for a young man. Now, here's the thing. How many, how many aspects of wisdom are the children of today being taught? Through the television? Think of all the stuff they're seeing. You know, I, I know I'm starting to sound like a real old fella. But when I was a kid, I didn't worry about anyone pulling out a doozy at elementary school and blowing me away. I only had one thing to worry about at elementary school, Dana Suttoth. He was the biggest bully in the whole school, man. He could whip anybody. And I didn't ever want him to get on me, and I was the fastest kid in school, so I, he wasn't going to catch me unless he figured out he had to get a motor scooter and come after me. But I was the only thing I had to worry about. I didn't have to worry about someone pulling out a knife on me. I didn't have to worry about We didn't need metal detectors. We didn't need security. Things have changed. What's changed? What's changed between the time I went to elementary school and now? God's out of the schools. We used to pray the Lord's Prayer every morning, pledge of allegiance to the flag every morning. Uh, the principal would come on, and most of the times, I'm pretty sure he was a, a, a Christian because at the end of his little address to all of us through that little intercom system that sometimes you couldn't really make out all he was saying, but he'd say, God bless you, y'all have a good day. What's changed? We've taken God out of the schools. We've taken the Ten Commandments off of every courthouse in the country we're working to get him off the money and God we trust because we're not sure which God it is now I mean just think about where our nation has headed and what's changed how's that working out for us how's that working for us because now kids get blown away in elementary school by someone who's watched something on a screen in their living room that says hey this is a great game let's chase people down in a stolen car and then let's pull out our machine guns and blow them all away and it's a video game that they paid 50 bucks for. What's changed? Well, the biggest thing is God's been evicted from America for the most part. Yeah, last time I looked, it was 2.2 uh, to 1, you know, for every one marriage that succeeds, 2.2 fell. That's bad. Yeah, yeah, 50%. Uh, how many, uh, the family structure. I know in Rome, 
One of the downfalls that most historians agree to that Rome, one of the reasons Rome fell and sort of fell apart was because of the disintegration of the family unit. I mean, homosexuality was rampant. Uh, prostitute, temple prostitutes, no, no one stayed at home. They, they were constantly engaged in uh, sex outside of marriage. I mean, and, and then I look at that and say, okay, well, they didn't have the TV and the Internet and the radio and all of those things pumping that stuff. So now what's happening to this country of 350-plus million people? Well, I know for the first time in all of history, less than 50% of the people of this country, 49 from what I recently read, 49%, only 49% of the people in this country believe in God. And less than 30%, less than 30%, I mean 70%, they're not in church on Sunday morning. They're not even thinking about it. Jesus made a statement, and I brought this up last night in the Bible study in the park. When the Son of Man comes... Shall he find faith on earth? He wasn't looking for an answer. The rhetorical question. The answer is implied in the question. True Bible faith. True Bible faith. Not just see you once a week, maybe. But true Bible devoted Christian faith when Christ comes again is going to be scarce. And that's where we're headed. Now the good news is not everybody's heading down this road. Over in Liberia and Monrovia, I support Crossway Missions. This church supports Crossway Missions. We support a missionary over there uh, by the name of Alfred. And Alfred, they're baptizing between 30 and 60 people a month. They go around to villages and preach and teach and knock on doors and pass out literature. The last one he had over the weekend, they baptized 47 people and started a new church and needed someone to be the preacher there. So they were hoping to get one of the fellows and his little crew of men that go out with him. They pile into cars, two or three cars, and they head up dirt roads that you and I probably wouldn't even want to go up. I don't know if there's a wildlife like there is in some parts of Africa there. It's a pretty big city from what I understand. But they go out into these little villages, and they preach Christ. And guess what? People are saying, you know what? I live on $2 a day. $2 a day. Guess what? They don't have internet. They don't have television. They don't have all this stuff. You know what they want? They want to know there's something better than this life. But here's the problem with us. is we turn our lives into a little heaven on earth. You know, we get all the luxuries, all the things that we want, everything good. And we don't, we don't worry so much because it's nice here. You know, it's nice. But let me tell you something. We're shortchanging ourselves. It's not heaven. There's still sickness, there's still disease, there's still crime, there's still hurt, pain, anguish, death, loss of loved ones, friends, relatives. All of those things are still here. And it doesn't matter how beautiful we build our little world and our little heaven. It's not going to stay. You're going to leave it. We're going to leave. No one stays. And you don't even need the Bible to tell you that. Just drive by a funeral home. Nobody stays. We all leave. And you're like, man, that's down, that's depressing. No, it's not. Not if you're a Christian. Not if you're a Christian, because this is just a place to make your decisions. I am going to follow God. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Make your decision, and then stick with it all the way to the end. And guess what that is? Wisdom. That's wisdom. And that's what he's trying to get across to you and to me and his son and everybody else who will read these Proverbs. Make that decision. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The same wise man penned those words. Now, the sad thing, he lost sight of that. He lost sight of it. We can't lose sight of it. Because I don't know about you. 50 years from now, I'm going to be on the other side. I might be on the other side 10 years from now. Things keep happening to me the way they've been happening to me. I might be on the other side next week, you know. <laughs> Ain't no telling, man. Pneumonia, bronchitis, COVID, all this. Man, I lie. The Lord's helping me, though, and I know what? I know one thing, and I, I kept quoting this to myself all last week and the pneumonia thing. 
All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I love God. I'm called according to his purpose. So I don't care what happens. God's going to make it work out to my betterment. But how many people are out there tonight? They don't know that. When I drive home, I'll drive by that gentleman's club. And guess what? That parking lot will be packed to the gills. Valet parking. Come on in. And the seductress, she's there. And those men don't even realize they're walking into a trap. I think that that could be a real uphill battle. Because there's redefining truth in a criminal is now a victim. (laughs) I guess you can't put a knock on that because it's so implied by law. Yeah. And you know what? We really should expect it. Jesus said, marvel not if the world hates you because it hated me first. It does not come to us because it hates the truth. It hates the light because the light reveals that what it does is evil. I think of the Old Testament, and woe unto them who call evil good and good evil. You know, I mean, there's, there's a great day coming, and God will settle all these things. You and I can only preach against it, teach against it, and say, listen, you want the truth? That's fine. You want someone to kiss you all the way to hell? Find another church. I'm not going to be the one doing that. I'll tell you the truth. It may get on your toes. I guarantee it. It's got on mine before it gets on yours. But the fact is, we've got to call evil, evil, and we've got to call good, good, and we've got to tell people, repent. The kingdom of God is here and coming. Jesus will come soon. And Does any other salvation need to? Look what history proves. The calling of ridiculous ass in his place of reduction. I mean, and they just don't understand that they're blind to their sheep. It's going to raise in place. Yeah. Well, one of the good things about it, Sam, is God's still in control. I don't understand it all, but I know God's in control. Yes. Sure. It, it would. It, what I mean by that is simply the person who, who follows this path, is going to feel like, wow, you know, the last place you want to be when you've done something wrong is with people who are doing something right. You know, you don't want to, you feel guilty. You tend to want to shun the whole, I don't want to hear that I'm doing wrong. When we do wrong, we don't want to hear. No one one needs to tell me that I'm doing wrong when I'm doing wrong. I know I'm doing wrong, but I don't want someone telling me that. And I sure don't want some fellow up in the pulpit shouting at me, telling me I'm doing that. So the tendency may be to stray away from that. Now, there's a lot of people today and I know I'm out of time, so I can't get in too much. But there are a lot of people today who say, once you're saved, you're always saved. You can't be lost. And that's a lie. That's a lie. The devil told that lie. The very first one that he ever spoke is, you shall not surely die. He said that to two children of God. You shall not surely die. It's a lie then. It's a lie now. And I can prove it with the book of Hebrews alone. I can prove it with the prodigal son. I can prove it with be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That's a conditional statement. We must be faithful unto death. I can't get into all of it now because I'm out of time, but there's a lot of people out there thinking, well, I can live this kind of lifestyle. I can do whatever I want to do, and it'll all be okay. You think Solomon was one of those people? No. No, I don't think so at all. Not when he was younger. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Actually, the, the Hebrew there says, for this is the whole of man. This is the whole of man. This is your job. Fear God and keep his commandments. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my commandments. And I'm actually going to touch that on Sunday morning and tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow noon, uh, the show uh, on divine deliberations. But the fact is, uh, no, you can't just live that kind of lifestyle and it's all okay with the Lord. You know? Now, there's a, there's a difference in falling into temptation, sinning, and then repenting and coming out. But this looks like the guy who says, hey, look, I, I like this. I'm going to hang out with her on a weekly basis, you know. And he's not going to turn and come back to the Lord. And that seems to be the, the, where that's headed. You know, you, you go hanging out in her neighborhood. You go living around those, those ladies like that. And next thing you know, you're going to be in a bad spot. And spiritually, it can be a dead end. I mean, the prodigal son, I believe, is one of the most beautiful parables Jesus ever told. But what's interesting about it is he came to himself. 
You know, he was in the pigsty, and he said, this is crazy. My, my father's servants have enough to eat, and here I am starving to death. And he repented. He said, I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your servants. And when that boy got up, he didn't just talk about it. He got up, got out of the pigsty, and headed home. Uh, when he got home, he was pretty disheveled. And I got a sermon, I think I've preached it here, I'm not sure, but it's called, Will God Run? And the answer to that question is yes. Because when his father saw him, I don't know why he recognized him. Maybe it was his gait. Maybe it was something about him. He sure wasn't dressed well. He had no shoes for his feet. But he ran to him, and he hugged him, and he embraced him. And he started his little spill. Father, I've sinned against heaven and am no longer worthy to be called your son. And he interrupted that speech and said, bring the, bring the robe for him, bring a ring, bring shoes for his feet, kill the fatted calf. My son was dead. He is alive again. So repentance can bring us back to God. And that's what I would love to think, that Solomon, at the end of his life, after he went down all these crazy roads, subtly and not as, not as blatantly as this young man he's instructing, but still being pulled down that road, would have came to his senses and said, you know what, this is not right. I'm tearing all these pagan gods down. Not going to happen anymore. I don't care whether you get mad at me or not. It's not going to happen anymore. But you don't see that anywhere in Scripture. Actually, the Scriptures closed with Solomon turned away because of his wives and worshipped idols. And so you don't see him coming back. So just a warning for us. No matter how wise we may get, the devil knows our weaknesses. And if he can get in, if we even crack that door just a little bit, and he gets in and exploits that one weakness, he can take you down the same road. Because Solomon was smarter than us, and he managed to pull it off there. All right, we're, we're just, a, yes, Jane. Okay. God inspired. Okay, good. Sure. Alfred's Monrovia, Liberia. No, not that I know of. Not that I know of. They're having a struggle with COVID because they don't have enough vaccines. And uh, so they have a lot of outbreaks with COVID. But they're still, you know, I look at Alfred in the situation there. The average income for the, for the people of Liberia is $2 a day. So they don't, they don't have a lot of hope. They're never probably going to get out of poverty. They're never going to have a great job. They're never going to have a big, huge house. I mean, most of them will live in poverty all their life. And then here comes Alfred with this message of the beautiful gospel of Christ. That says, you know what? God loves you. He's, he's sent his son to die for you. He washed away all your sins if you'll come to him on his terms. And guess what? You're going to go to heaven one day. And there's mansions and you're going to be in the presence and live in the presence of God. And all of the trials of this life, all the sickness, all the dying. I mean, they lost an evangelist two weeks ago in a car wreck, and he was 22 years old. He was part of Alfred's team. But guess what? Guess where he is right now? Last thing he did was go on that campaign where they hit 47 people. And I believe he had just preached the Sunday before. It was, I think it was on a Monday that he left this world. But guess where he's at now? You see, for them, there's hope. For us, we've created little heavens on earth for ourselves, and so we, we just want to stay here. I told you all about Hot Springs, right? Jimmy Allen asked one of the preachers in Hot Springs, Arkansas, which is a very, very beautiful place. I don't know how many of y'all might have been there before. Natural hot springs, bathhouses, all kinds of beautiful restaurants, great places to eat, and just a gorgeous place to live. He said, how are y'all doing as far as conversions? He said, well, we're not doing much. He said, why? He said, nobody wants to go to heaven from hot springs because they've already made a heaven, you know. That's what the preacher told him. No one wants to go to heaven from hot springs. It's heaven here. So we got to be careful because no matter how good we make it, we're still leaving. We're still leaving. All right, I'm out of time. I'm over time. But anyway, thanks for being here. Next week, Proverbs, the eighth chapter. Uh, continue to remember my mother in your prayers as she recovers. Remember those who were mentioned tonight. Uh, case friend, uh, Raul's uh, ex-wife. Remember those uh, that are in need of prayer. And let's uh, remember those who are on our prayer list. Let's lift them up before the Lord. Any other announcements we need to make before we close? All right.
Let's have a closing prayer. Our Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for being our God. We're thankful for the time we can come together as family, brothers and sisters in your family, to study your word, to know your will for our lives. Help us to encourage one another, to provoke one another to love and good works. Help us to realize we're just here for a little while, and then we're coming home. Thank you for preparing the way for us. Thank you for sending Jesus to to ready us. Be with us now as we leave this place. Keep us safe and bring us back at the next appointed time that we might worship you in spirit and in truth and learn more of you. Thank you for loving us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. It's good to be